it's a real pleasure to welcome you, Ingrid. When we met for the first time in Mumbai several years ago, I felt a connection that I didn't really feel that much when I was in India because of all the cultural differences. But immediately, I felt a connection and I really enjoyed our time together. I very much appreciate your coming and talking to our audience, who I think will find uh, your story and your ideas really fascinating. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Charlie. It's, it's lovely to reconnect. Yeah, same here. Let's bring the audience a little bit closer to your personal story. So if you could just share kind of your background and history and what's brought you to where you are, wherever you would define that as being at this point, I think our audience would love to hear it. I was raised in a Catholic family in South Bombay, where I have to say I enjoyed a pretty comfortable and almost idyllic childhood. Uh, my dad was a journalist. My mom worked in the corporate sector and I had two siblings. Um, and I think uh, unlike m most Indian households, I want to say, ours was very, very egalitarian in terms of gender roles, in terms of the kind of discussion, debate, opinion, opinionatedness, if you will, uh, that uh, children and adults both had around the breakfast table or the dinner table, partly, of course, because my dad was a journalist. And so, you know, current affairs and politics and culture were just what we spoke about every day. To put this contextually, what years are we talking about here? So I was born in 1962. So I'm exactly 60 years old. And so this would have been sort of the 60s going up, going through to the early 80s, really. Mm -hmm. um, this is, of course, I mean, you know, this is as privileged in some senses as an upbringing in in India can get, especially if you're female, because as you know only too well, we are a country that is extremely hostile to girls and women. There's everything from female infanticide and feticide to all forms of neglect, all forms of exclusion, all forms of discrimination that young women in India face. And I mean, for me, those were not even barriers I was aware of really till I left home. Both at home then and, you know, in, in the convent, Catholic convent school that I attended, I think looking back now, my formative experiences were really grounded in values like justice and equity, but equally in the belief that power and power structures are reasonable, that they can be negotiated with that they don't have to be blindly complied with or feared in any way, which I think is also very, very different from the sort of authoritarian childhoods that many children in India, even today, uh, are subject to. I went on then to study uh, economics and statistics at Bombay University and then did my MBA from the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta. I started my professional life in advertising, and mainly I think I was drawn to it because of the constant novelty and variety it offered. I mean, I, I sometimes describe myself as a, as a superficial person, and I think that you know, ability to be talking banking in the morning and detergents in the afternoon and going to a film shoot in the evening really suited my personality. But also, again, when I sort of now retrofit a logic, uh, I think it gave me one skill that is incredibly useful, that I found incredibly useful when I came to the nonprofit sector. And that is the ability to align people with very, very different interests and motivations around a common shared goal. So in advertising, this would be the creative people who are motivated by, you know, just trying new things and winning awards and that sort of stuff with the bean counters who were looking at profitability and billings and revenue and so on. But the ability to get these very, very different groups of people to find common purpose, I think, was the role of an account management person in advertising. I didn't know it at the time, but it was really fantastic preparation for work in civil society where you're constantly having to bring about consensus among very, very different people. The other thing it gave me, I think, was an appreciation of what the, the, the skill involved in taking large amounts of data and turning them into a compelling communication proposition, something that's a persuasive piece of communication. I think that's really also something that stood me in great stead in this sector. 
I'm very easily bored, perhaps because I am such a superficial person. And so, you know, a little over a decade in advertising, I find myself getting very, very dissatisfied with the lack of, you could say, impact, the lack of any sort of leaving any substantial mark on the world. I went into a literally a year, year and a half of struggling to figure out what I could do with such skills as I had. And I was really, really lucky to happen upon this organization called CRY, uh, which stands for Child Rights in You. At the time, it stood for Child Relief in You, which is India's leading child rights organization. The important thing, I think, or what the luck or the serendipity involved there was the fact that CRY was one of the few nonprofits in India at the time that really understood the value of brands and the value of marketing. And so we, act, I, mean, I could actually add value to what they were doing. And what we were able to do in the decade that I spent at Cry, eventually as its CEO, was to completely re-engineer those fundraising systems and those donor management systems to build, you know, innovation, resilience, spectacular uh, levels of growth over that period. What that allowed us then was the autonomy or the freedom to become much more rights-oriented, much more advocacy-driven. And so we were able to convene a coalition of organizations across the country to actually get the Constitution of India amended to make education a fundamental right. But then again, you know, 10 years on, I was back to my usual problem with boredom. And Complete serendipity again. It was literally on a sidewalk in Brooklyn that I was having this conversation with a friend when he suggested that I might want to consider the role of Secretary General at Civicus, which is an organization. It's a global coalition of, of civil society organizations that's headquartered in Johannesburg in South Africa. Now, I love South Africa already from previous visits, and the job sounded fantastic, mainly because it involved doing things I knew nothing about. So it would sort of, you know, steepen the learning curve again. And so I moved to South Africa. This was, of course, in 2008. This was, of course, just after the global financial crisis had broken. And I think what I, what, what I learned there was, first of all, getting a view of the insides of these global institutions that are supposed to determine our fates, the UN and the World Bank and the IMF, but equally the World Economic Forum and Davos and so on. And really to see up close just how how much these institutions have been captured by big business in particular. But also I think as as a learning for me, the idea of you know, leading a very large, very diverse coalition of organizations. You had, you know, the big international NGOs at one end and Oxfam or an Amnesty or a Greenpeace. But then at the other hand, you know, the women in white in Cuba or uh, the Pastoralist Association of Kenya. And to be able to listen really intently to what all of them wanted, but then to synthesize solutions that will be acceptable to all of them and get them on board in advocating for those solutions, I think was a was for me the second best part of my experience at Civicus. The best was actually living in South Africa, which is a country that I continue to love deeply. So I came back to India in 2012, mostly for personal reasons, and I really struggled to find something that I could be interested in at that point. I spent a year at Childline India, which is a remarkable example of how good a solution you can create when you actually get government and uh, civil society to collaborate meaningfully. Then I spent a couple of years at Hevos, which is a Dutch NGO, where, among other things, I, I got a firsthand view of the impending clamp down on civil society, particularly on foreign funding. So when in 2016, I heard that Ashoka University, which was this new philanthropically funded liberal arts university being set up just outside of Delhi, that they were considering uh, setting up what would be India's and South Asia's first academic study to focus on uh, social impact and philanthropy, I was like, this is perfect. You know, it allows me to bring everything I've ever done as a fundraiser, as a grant maker, as a 
as an activist, as an advocate, as a researcher, as a communicator to bear on solving what is, I think, an important problem, which is really strengthening the ecosystem around philanthropy and civil society in India. Well, that is quite an amazing story. And you may describe it as superficiality, moving you from one thing to the other. I think you know a little bit about my own experiences that went from being a history teacher to being a PhD in psychology and to being a business person and now to the life you can save working with Peter Singer. And that's what brought me to India to meet you. It's been extremely challenging to raise money for the operations of the life you can save so that we can promote these 25 nonprofits or move to India and find someone wonderful like you to help run an organization in India that can do the same thing in India. It turns out that the whole effective giving movement in in the West, um, including all of the ones that call themselves effective altruists, they all eschew marketing. When I've talked to GiveWell about marketing, they kind of laugh. They say, we're not in the business of marketing. We're in the business of researching high-impact nonprofits. And I think, oh my gosh, you're missing this amazing opportunity. You could be scaling your impact by reaching new audiences. But I feel like in some sense, I'm a lone voice. So I want to ask you, who have really a lot of direct experience in marketing, what you think the role of marketing and advertising could be in promoting the best impact for your dollar for donors who in the United States only about 6% even give money overseas. So if you were to apply these skills that you've gotten through your superficial ventures into things over 10 year periods, if you were to now apply that, what are the thoughts that occur to you off the top of your head about how we should go about or whether we should go about using marketing to manage donations to high impact charities in much the same way that consumer packaged goods companies manage their products, short of putting a Super Bowl ad on television. Have you thought about this, Ingrid? Do you have any ideas about this? A lot. So, I mean, first of all, the short answer to your question is yes, we should. We can and should import some of the the frameworks and tools that mainstream marketing uses into our sector to advance scale and impact. But that said, that needs to be done with some caveats against sort of blindly adopting those tools. It it, it should be a no-brainer, and I agree with you here. I mean, I'm I'm constantly mystified by people's unwillingness to to get this. It should be a no-brainer that nonprofits in particular, even more than consumer packaged goods companies, have only one currency, and that is trust. And what is a brand if not a trust mark. The whole evolution of the idea of a brand is that this is something I don't know the person who made this soap or I don't know who's selling it to me, but because it is this brand, I trust it to be of a certain quality and reliability and so on. Now, clearly in a sector where trust is the core currency, uh, the value of brands is disproportionately more. But the means by which you would build a brand in uh, our sector might be quite different from the way that a consumer product might do it. So the same, for example, and not just overall brand building, but the idea of market segmentation, of picking who your target donor or volunteer or employee is, uh, the idea of positioning the idea of uh, analyzing and then making a data-driven choice of distribution channels, for example. Cry was already a strong brand when I joined, but what we found when we did our market research, which is something that nonprofits don't do enough of, was that there was this huge gap between people out there that knew Cry and liked Cry and trusted Cry versus the number, the percentage of them that actually gave us money. And the the gap was not one of credibility or trust. The gap was one of convenience. So we really had to completely rejig our distribution channels in order to capitalize on the goodwill that the brand enjoyed. And of course, in the process, also strengthen the brand. I found social media hugely beneficial in attracting media attention to the issues that I think are important that I would like to see amplified in the media. I watched a couple of weeks ago, Charlie, 
a live demo that just blew my mind. This thing combined machine learning with new artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT and DAL-E and so on to first identify which demographic was the one most likely to be interested in this particular cause, then to craft at least a, a draft communication that would appeal to this demographic, down to even picking the images that the artificial intelligence suggested might be the most appealing to this demographic. And it did this in less than five minutes. So every tool out there that's currently benefiting for profit marketing is something that we could and should be profitably using in our sector if we intend to achieve the sort of scale of impact that we need to achieve to address these wicked, wicked problems that we're dealing with. When you look at the world today, what do you think the three to five most significant problems that we're facing in the world, whether it's in India or whether it's in the world in general, that you see macro problems? If I had to pick five, I would pick inequality, the climate crisis, the corporate takeover of both mindsets and institutions, the shrinking space for democracy, the, the democratic recession, let's call it, and, and the shrinking space for civil society. Those would be the five top things that I would I would list. For me, despite sort of, you know, being a person of color, a woman, growing up in the global south, I, I clearly see how I have been a beneficiary of really multiple systems of privilege that give me so many, so many advantages. But equally, thanks to the work I've done, I've had the privilege to work across sectors, business, civil society, and the academy. The diversity of this, this experience, it gives me, I think, a rare perspective to be able to join these dots across these uh, these issues. And it, it should be clear, I think, but apparently it isn't, that we actually don't stand a chance of, of staving off the climate crisis if we don't tackle inequality, for example. Because to the, to the greater the inequality, the greater we need GDP to grow in order that the poorest are, are not uh, below the survival limit. The more equal that distribution is, the less we would need to grow, the less we would need to pollute, emit, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The same with gender, the, 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 the same with, with race and with caste in India. The fact that we're excluding such large pools of talent from bringing their, their talents to bear on solving these problems, I think should be apparent to most people. But also when you look at sort of more proximate causes like education, like health, like livelihoods, it should be clear, I think, to most people that we're not going to make headway on those, or at least we're not going to make long-lasting impact on those if we don't have, for example, a well-resourced, protected, resilient civil society. We're not going to affect, I mean, if you look at what's happened in China recently, whether that's with big business or whether that's with COVID, you're not going to be able to address any of these complex 21st century problems without functioning democracies. Do we start micro or do we start macro? And I'm actually thinking of you specifically, as well as how the life you can save should proceed, because one of the purposes of this podcast is to help people understand the dilemma that the life you can save is in, but in a much broader context. I'm trying to think from a marketing perspective of ways of capturing this idea of my home is your home, your home is my home, without challenging people's notions that charity begins at home, because I'm constantly running into that. What do you think of somehow trying to get people to overcome, not their bias that charity begins at home, or, and again, the word charity in itself is very uh, paternalistic, but that helping or empowering begins at home, but challenging it from within and getting people to redefine what home means. Do you think there's something there? So I think, you know, if there was one lesson we could take away from the pandemic, it's this one, right? I mean, because you, you, you saw how the whole world was brought to a standstill by a virus that traveled 
across every continent within days. And that the, you know, the fact that we, that you sitting in, in Washington are only as well protected as our public health systems here in India allow us to be in terms of de- early detection, genome mapping, et cetera, et cetera. And so that you have an interest in ensuring that we have here in India at least some basic public health uh, services that will allow you to be safer, more prosperous, healthier, all of it. What is mystifying to me is how quickly we seem to be forgetting those lessons of the pandemic and moving as quickly as we can back to whatever we defined as businesses as as usual. I think we made a similar mistake at the end of the financial crisis where we really didn't pursue the the clear disparities that that thing threw up in terms of really the corporate takeover uh, of governance. But I think this time we'd be really doing ourselves a disservice if we don't relentlessly drive home this message that your children are only as safe as children on the other side of the planet. When I turn my attention back to civil society, as you say, I'm influenced by this girl in the pond. I want to save that girl. I want to save lots of those girls. And then now coming back to civil society later in my life, I'm thinking, okay, I am not going to be having a hand in changing civil society, but what I can do is save one. And the life you can save really speaks to me because not only can we save one, but I think in the 10 years we've, we've helped empower and save thousands of, of young children um, and doing other things. And what do you think about working in the micro environment, working back in the macro environment um, in terms of how one, particularly you, Ingrid, use your time at this point? Because clearly we need attention to both and they're connected. I remember a conversation with a uh, friend, a civil society activist friend, in South Africa. And she was talking to me the story about the starfish, right? Where there's this child and her father walking along the beach and there are these starfish that are stranded on the sand and she starts picking them up and throwing them back into the sea. And her father says exactly the same thing to her that Ray Fiennes says to Rachel Weiss, which is, you know, you can't save them all. And she said, yeah, but I can save this one. My African friend said to me, she says, you know, I've spent my life throwing starfish back into the sea and my arms are getting really tired. I really need to figure out what's causing them to get, you know, beached in the first place. And I think that's the the dilemma, right? Which is, do you focus on the starfish here and now or the child here and now that needs immediate relief? Or do you go upstream to figure out what is causing these problems in the first place and try to uh, address them there? And I don't think it's either or. I actually think you need both. I don't think your upstream actions are going to be effective uh, or relevant even if they aren't informed by that direct delivery of services in the here and now. I think you need to do provide the relief here and now. Your experience doing that, your learning doing that is then what informs your advocacy for policy change, for example. How do you ensure that the policies you're advocating for are actually relevant to the people that are dealing with these problems? So I think it's it's a you need to do both. Uh, and then you move even further upstream and you say you need to build the institutions uh, that can um, provide the knowledge, the data, the build the networks that allow for uh, advocacy to be more effective, for people to learn from each other. So there's a, it's a three-tier process, I think. There's direct service delivery in the here and now. There's policy change uh, at the next level. And then there's ecosystem building to ensure that the other two are relevant and sustainable and and well well informed and i can't see these as being either or they feed off each other they're all amplified by each other they all need each other in order to be more effective very well answered i i I think you're of course i agree with you i also think about what am i going to do at my age individually and who can i reach out to at each of these levels i'm thinking that even in india where i'm not so familiar but 
I think of two problems we address through our charities uh, at The Life You Can Save. There are nonprofits working on vaccine distribution, which is very important for these children under five. And there are nonprofits in the, that are working on food fortification. We have Project Healthy Children. And perhaps the link in India, and you know this way better than I do, might be what you do to try to deliver those programs through various state governments, particularly the ones that are more inclined to do that kind of thing and to work with a nonprofit that's very clever at doing it. And the more you can learn in that, the more you can spread it to other states and maybe even to the national government. I learned in India, at least it seemed to me, that we need to work uh, with nonprofits, but working also for scale with state governments. Is that correct? So, yes, um, you need to work with individual nonprofits. And within the nonprofit, you need to not just fund program uh, delivery, but you know, building that nonprofit institutional strength. So that's capacity building, technology, reserves, financial resilience, all that stuff. Then you need to ensure, I think, that nonprofits can build networks and coalitions that can deliver the kind of advocacy that then moves government policy. I think what you want to guard against is philanthropy that weakens communities' abilities to seek solutions for themselves. I think if your philanthropy, if your partnership with government is letting government off the hook in terms of its accountability to its citizens, or if it is substituting government, what what government should be doing, so really substituting what are citizen entitlements with charity, Uh, for lack of a better word, then I think uh, you may be exacerbating a problem rather than solving it. The Life You Can Save is trying to become a trusted brand in India. One of the things I'm hoping for over the next 10 years is that we're able to identify an increasing number of those nonprofits that work across those ultimately three levels that you're talking about. Coincidentally, I had this conversation just yesterday with an online giving platform in India. Yes, the more information you can gather about nonprofits that will allow donors to make more informed choices about these nonprofits and to to do to contribute with with a sense of confidence that if their money is not going to be stolen that it's going to be effectively used to create impact that's all good but what if you design those systems in a way that they also provide nonprofits with the diagnostics they need to strengthen their systems and to improve their impact. So rather than this being a measurement system designed only for donors, what if you were to design a measurement system that also empowers nonprofits? Then you would have, I think, a much, much more powerful engine of impact than just the one or the other. Is this Give India? This is Give India, yes. Imagine, Charlie, if each nonprofit had a little dashboard that they could look at, that they would say, look, when it comes to your adoption of technology, you're in the 40th percentile of organizations like you. Uh, whereas in your communications, you're at 95th percentile. Imagine if I could literally see that changing in real time and experiment with things and and try to improve my scores on each of those things, not just because they get more money, but because they actually allow me, the nonprofit, to use those resources both more efficiently and more effectively. I think that Give India is doing a great service, and this is a wonderful way to help them rethink what they're doing. What I struggle with with Give India is they have so many recommendations How do they do a proper vetting or how do they help the nonprofits? What can you do when you have so many? I do think that your advising of Give India is important because they are currently sort of the place people go who are interested and how we can get the wealthiest people in India interested in helping an organization like Give India get better because it does take resources in order to do that. I want to just, before we end, I want to turn to a few more personal questions. One is, do you have any projects that are currently in process that you're wanting to talk about? Or are you also just wanting to talk about getting some more space in your life? There are two questions that are interesting. They're not yet projects. They're just questions I'm thinking about. 
Uh, one um, is the question of the way I'm framing it is how do we return civil society to citizens, both civil society and philanthropy to citizens? Because what's happened certainly in India over the last 20 years or so is both philanthropy and civil society have sort of become a bit remote. Uh, philanthropy is something that, you know, Azim Primji and Ratan Tata are supposed to do, and civil society is something that activists and NGOs are supposed to do, whereas I, the citizen, have become more or less a passive, either a spectator or at best a sort of you know, occasional contributor to these processes. So this idea of how we put citizens back into the center of these two, two great uh, fields is one of the questions that's of interest to me. It means reconfiguring the idea of philanthropy to mean not just the writing of big checks, but to really how do we, as, as in our everyday lives, how do we make a difference in the world? And some of this was sparked by uh, Lucy Bernholtz's book, which is The How We Give Now, which is, of course, based on a U.S. experience. But to me, this was a fundamental shift that she made that I found interesting, which is she didn't ask the question, how do you give now? She asked the question, how do you make a difference in the world? So, so sort of redefining philanthropy. I mean, there's some ideas I have on, on how that might be possible. Uh, the second question is the question of, what is the proper role of philanthropy in a functioning democracy? Because I worry that in India, as much as anywhere else, but particularly in India, philanthropy is increasingly seeing its role as becoming a substitute or a gap filler. You know, these are the, the public services that government is unable uh, to do justice to. And so philanthropy fills those gaps rather than asking questions around how are these budgets being allocated in the first place? And, you know, should we be looking at a, a better, a more redistributive system of taxation if, if we're short on revenues to fund the social protection systems that we need? So uh, these two questions are the ones that I'm thinking about. This, this is, of course, all, all uh, competing with both my superficiality as well as my current, I, I really don't want to manage anything. I'm just so done managing things. And I've been managing things one way or another for the better part of 35 or 36 years. And it's exhausting. Um, so I need to really find, I'm, I'm seeing my role more as an instigator here, somebody who can, can catalyze people into taking on bits and pieces of these puzzles uh, and helping to solve them. Well, I think that the managing people and managing processes is something that I tired of myself, but I also would like to be catalytic and facilitating. I, I sort of changed the metaphor in my life, partly having grandchildren and my children being grown. I used to think of myself as striving ineffectively often to be a leader, and now I'm striving to be a facilitator, which is really, really different. And as a male, it means dealing with your ego sometimes which is very difficult for me to do. I may try to get some of your uh, catalytic energy. Let me just end right here on this question, which I'm asking all of our guests, and maybe I'll string them together one day in an episode with the answer. What does it mean to you, Ingrid, to live a moral life? So I'm not a religious person, and um, I'm actually quite wary about any sort of you know prescriptions around uh, morality, but... My father, who was a, a deeply religious man, uh, once offered me a rubric, if you will, that I thought found useful. He was, and he's like, religion aside, if you live your life assuming that someday you're gonna run for high office and you're gonna have people, you know, examine every everything you did in microscopic detail, then that's a good rubric to ensure you lead a good life. But beyond that, I think there's, for me personally, I think what is it that allows me to sleep well at night? What is it that allows me to feel comfortable in my own skin, especially in a country where, as you know, Charlie, the inequalities, the disparities are so in your face. And so, you know, what is it that allows me to look at that child living on the street or speak to that woman that's working four jobs a day to just to feed her children and and feel comfortable in my skin i think that for me 
is a moral life. Well, I think listening to you today will help citizens be more optimistic about their ability to affect things in a world in which all of us are feeling quite powerless, I think, much of the time. And you are inspirational in spite of what you may think of yourself in allowing us to feel like we do have the power to make a difference, maybe not make the difference, but to make a difference as citizens. And if we can, as citizens, connect with one another across all the various sectors and recapture democracy and civil society. And I really appreciate your spending this time with us. It's been fascinating for me. I knew it would be interesting. Um, it's surpassed even my wildest expectations. So thank you very much, Ingrid. Thank you, Charlie. You're very kind.